great. I have great pleasure in welcoming uh, Professor Jimmy Whitworth. Um, Jimmy is a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, is an expert on pandemic preparedness and outbreak response, uh, runs a massive online course for the London School on this very topic, uh, has also uh, advised the, 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 the kind of public health equivalent of UK EMT uh, on their own rapid deployment team and stepped down, I think, from directing that team uh, last year. Um, I don't know what's, I mean, his extensive publication record, research in infectious diseases, uh, evaluation and intervention roles and in lots of different agencies, including WHO. Um, I'm, I'm going to make him blush. So I'm going to stop and let him speak for himself. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome him. And thanks very much, Jimmy, for, for talking to us today. Great. Well, thanks very much, Stephen, for that uh, 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 introduction. Um, let me just find my slides to share with you. And here we go. Right. Um, so um, for this last talk, what I thought I'd do is I'd, I'd take a step back and, and look at, at the picture um, really giving quite a long lens in um, thinking about outbreaks and how we prepare for the next global outbreak. I'll start with this, this cartoon here. And uh, the, the point here is that we've always been vulnerable to outbreaks of infectious diseases. And Noah is quite right to, to be concerned. He's in a constrained environment, it's very crowded, he's got lots of animals around him, and uh, also there are birds in the vicinity too. He's, he's worried particularly about respiratory infections, because if, if they uh, are passed on to either the humans or the animals on the ark, then he and his family are potentially in uh, a serious problem. Even before coronavirus, uh, governments were concerned about outbreaks of infectious diseases. This slide here just shows you the UK National Re Risk Register that's kept by the, uh, the Cabinet Office. And this shows you the, the top risks that are on there. Um, and you can see that pandemic influenza is, is right up there. The, the relative impact of that is seen as being higher than any of the other risks that we have here, even things like coastal flooding, major industrial accidents, attacks in crowded places and so on. And the relative likelihood is pretty high too. Now, um, part of this comes from our uh, concerns with outbreaks that we've seen recently. Um, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, was the first emerging infection in the 21st century, arising in China in 2002. And that spread globally through international air travel. It was a novel corona virus pathogen spread by respiratory droplets. It had an animal reservoir and came to us through bats. Um, anything sound at all familiar there about our current situation? Anyway, overall with SARS, there were uh, about 8,000 cases overall and uh, 700 deaths. So in terms of um, thinking about uh, morbidity, indeed mortality, uh, uh, burden around the world, it wasn't that great. But the costs involved in actually controlling this pandemic range from estimates of 10 billion to 30 billion dollars. So, and I'll come back to this, the cost of dealing with outbreaks is often much more than the actual um, uh, pathology burden that we see. Now, I'm talking here about emerging infections, and I ought to clarify what I mean here. And the Institute of Medicine uh, definition of this is new or re-emerging or drug-resistant infections where the incidence in humans has increased within the past 20 years or threatens to increase in the near future. 
And this has been modified slightly to uh, put in a, a geographical element to that. So if a population um, ha hasn't been exposed to this before, or the geographic range of this infection has extended, then that also can be an emerging infection. So this will include apparently new microorganisms, but also old, well-known pathogens that are re-emerging, and also includes adapted microorganisms, so drug-resistant variants as well, responsible for outbreaks. Next point I want to make is infections emerge regularly. This is just looking over the period from 1980 to, uh, to 2010, and that just shows you some of the emerging infections that occurred over that 30-year uh, period. So things like um, Lyme disease, HIV, uh, Hendra virus, uh, Nipah virus are all things that that uh, first were occurred or were first recognised in human populations during that period. And not only do they occur all the time, but they occur everywhere. Again, this is looking at a 20-year period here, and this is just looking at outbreaks occurring around the world over that period. And as you can see, they're occurring all over the place. And it's a dynamic situation as well. This is a word cloud uh, put together from ProMed posts. Now, ProMed is a, um, a, a website where uh, uh, health workers put information about um, uh, outbreaks and clusters of infectious diseases that are occurring around the world. And this is looking in 2013, 2014, 15 and 16 at where the posts were coming from. So you can see, for example, in 2013, a lot of talk in Europe about measles. By 2014, that had uh, morphed towards more talk about chikungunya. Um, at the same time, Ebola was emerging in uh, Africa. Uh, that continued through 2015, but a lot of talk about MERS uh, at that stage. That's Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Um, and by the time we get to 2016, in Africa, they're talking about Lassa, cholera, yellow fever, Ebola, polio, malaria, measles, anthrax, rabies. So you can see this is dynamic and changes in different parts of the world over time. Now, uh, I showed you Africa there, and um, the, the WHO Afro office produces a bulletin every week about outbreaks and other emergencies. And this is just a typical one that I picked up. Um, there were 45 ongoing events just on the African continent that were being followed at that time. 30 were outbreaks, 16 were humanitarian crises. And the point here is that you would think from looking at the UK press that there were one or two uh, big outbreaks occurring around the world uh, every year. But that's not the case. There are outbreaks occurring all the time, all over the place. In 2019, there were, according to WHO, 152 substantial public health events which needed external support that they were involved with. And in the first months of 2020, they'd seen 127. Most of those are infectious disease outbreaks, but there are also humanitarian crises and poisonings uh, in there as well. Here are some of the apparently new infections that have occurred over time. Um, rotavirus might interest you there. Um, 1973 first recognised. Um, I'm sure it was there before, we just didn't know what it was. So that's why I put apparently new against, against these. These are conditions that um, are recognised over time. Now, the vast majority of new infections are zoonoses. And by zoonoses, I'm talking about uh, diseases, infections that we share with animals. 
This first, the big figure here, uh, looks at uh, different stages when thinking about the relationship between pathogens and animals and humans. And stage one is thinking about infections that are exclusive to animals and don't infect humans. So something like squirrel pox would be an example there. And at the top, stage five, exclusive to humans um, and don't affect other animals at all. Measles would be an example there. So stage one and stage five, they're not zoonoses because we don't share those with animals. But two, three and four are zoonoses. Stage two are infections where they mainly occur in animals, but you can get sporadic human cases occurring from close contact with those animals, but they don't transmit from person to person. And avian influenza would be a classic example there. Stage three is where there's limited human to human transmission. So it's mostly coming into humans from other animals. So in this case, it would be multimammate rats. And you can get human to human transmission occurring, but it's not sustained and it doesn't develop any further. Lassa fever would be a, a good example here. Stage four where you get sustained human to human transmission. It starts in an animal reservoir, gets into the human population, and then uh, can continue to transmit from person to person. These are the kind of zoonoses that we're particularly concerned about. Things like Ebola would fit into this category. And of course, COVID-19 also would be a stage four zoonosis. And if you look at viruses and you look at all the viruses in mammals, you can see that um, just over half only affect other mammals and not humans at all. But of the ones that do affect humans, uh, two thirds of those are shared. In other words, are zoonoses. And there's only 13% overall that are exclusive to humans. So zoonoses are common and a particular concern for outbreaks. Another way I, I rather like of, of, of looking at this is something that I, I learned from Robin Weiss, and this is thinking about uh, the, the human population's collection of viruses and thinking of those rather like an art gallery. Now, in an art gallery, you might have uh, some pictures that are family heirlooms. These are the original core of your collection. And for viruses, these would be those that co-evolved with, with the host that came to us when we uh, diverged from other primates. And things like herpes virus, CMV, varicella zoster, papillomaviruses, hepatitis B, uh, are all um, viruses that have evolved in human population and have evolved in these cases to generally cause not much in the way of pathology, uh, but to be able to persist in humans. Then we have new acquisitions, and by new, I mean in the last 12,000 years when we settled down to sedentary uh, farming existence. And these are adapted now to long-term maintenance in humans. So things like measles that came to us from uh, cattle or smallpox that came from camels, um, influenza, which come to us frequently from birds, dengue that came from monkeys, HIV that came from uh, chimpanzees are all examples of new acquisitions that get into the human population and then maintain. And then we have the temporary exhibits where the, these are the paintings that we borrow from other collections on a temporary basis. Similarly with viruses, um, we, we borrow viruses from uh, other animals which may persist for a while in human population, but eventually we give them back. Things like rabies or Lassa or SARS or Ebola or uh, possibly Zika too. So that's a way of, of, of just thinking about how uh, viruses and humans interact. So 
when we think about what are the major drivers for the emergence of infections occurring, then there's a whole range, and it's it's really a very multidisciplinary level of things here. Things like, has the microbe itself adapted? Have there been ecological or land, cha land use changes or the climate? Is it to do with human things like international travel and trade um, or technology, changes in agriculture, population, behavior, immunosuppression, and so on. And I'll talk about some of these uh, in, the, in the next section now. So first of all, uh, population growth. If we have overcrowding with urbanization, this increases the risk of outbreaks. Um, there are challenges for providing good sanitation in those situations. Um, landfill for waste becomes an issue which might bring other animals in close contact with humans. Um, providing uh, energy consumption might mean that um, uh, all the forests around are cut down and how land is used to grow food in that area will all change. And so all of those can contribute to uh, uh, development of outbreaks. Poverty is also important. We have more than a billion people living in extreme poverty, particularly in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And intersecting with that, two billion people suffering from uh, undernutrition um, or a lack of basic health care or access to clean water. We live in an increasingly interconnected world. Um, about one trip, international trip per UK citizen is made every year. And it's estimated that 2 million people cross an international border every day. So any idea that you can isolate a country from, um, from the rest of the world for any long period of time is, is really quite hard to imagine. And we're seeing the challenges of doing this with coronavirus. Now, a good public health system is one that you don't notice, and you don't notice it because nothing happens. But if that public health system breaks down, then you can get failures in surveillance and in response, and it allows the re-emergence of uh, previously controlled diseases. So, for example, uh, if sanitation breaks down, then cholera is a risk. Vector control, if you're no longer controlling your tsetse flies, then trypanosomiasis, uh, complacency, and you, you, you uh, stop surveying for tuberculosis, you see upsurges, and non-compliance, particularly with things like um, vaccine-preventable diseases, where people start to perceive an increased risk individually from adverse events to that uh, vaccine compared to the risk of getting the natural disease. The, the uh, graph on the right just shows you how diphtheria um, e emerged in the Russian Federation um, after the collapse of the USSR. This was a previously controlled disease that hadn't been seen in a developed country for more than 30 years previously. So when you get a breakdown in your health, public health systems, you get increased risk of outbreaks, and it also discourages the population from making presentation uh, because they don't have trust in the health system anymore, and this undermines any response. War contributes to breakdown of uh, infrastructure, but also you're going to have large population movements, not just the armies, but also refugees who are then at risk. And recent examples would include cholera in uh, Yemen, where we saw over a million cases uh, recently. And here you've got a vulnerable population with airstrikes on hospitals and on infrastructure and no government funding for, for public health. So perhaps no surprise. Um, Ebola uh, recently in Eastern DRC 
um, uh, occurred in the context of a humanitarian crisis that had been going on for 20 years and over 100 different multiple armed militia in the area and a complete breakdown of community trust. Climate change often underlies uh, some of the drivers for outbreaks occurring. So things like changes in food production or loss of agricultural land, encroachment into wild habitats, people having to move, but also things like uh, vectors changing their distribution. So malaria, uh, uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, or Aedes mosquitoes changing their distribution as, uh, as the climate changes. So we're beginning to see in, in Southern Europe, the steady march of Aedes uh, transmitted infections occurring, things like chikungunya and dengue being reported more frequently. I mentioned earlier that one of the problems with epidemics is that they're unpredictable, there's a wide ranging burden and there can be a significant socioeconomic impact just of the threat, whether there are cases or not. And we're living through some of that right now. There may be disruption and cost, which is unrelated to the morbidity burden. So, for example, in the West Africa Ebola outbreak, the uh, the morbidity burden coming from measles and malaria and maternal deaths because of the breakdown of health services was greater than the direct cause of Ebola itself. Also, we have a situation where when we have more surveillance going on, we actually have more false alarms of outbreaks occurring. And so we tend to, to act on the basis of those, um, whereas they may not come to pass. There's a variable potential for these to become established within the population or indeed to know how severe that disease is, is going to be. And for quite a long time with coronavirus, it was a bit unclear quite how serious this, 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 this was, what the relationship was between asymptomatic and symptomatic cases and mild illness and more severe illness. This means that communication and transparent risk assessment become essential because there's always a risk of rumors and misinformation spreading. This isn't new for coronavirus. This goes on with every outbreak that occurs. And we often see a mix of complacency and then overreaction. And we've seen uh, in the UK in recent years, uh, typical examples of this where we've had outbreaks of particularly measles in adolescent populations where they didn't get vaccinated as children, and then um, a, a panic about making sure that people are vaccinated. Give you a few examples of some recent outbreaks. Um, Ebola in, in West Africa, uh, seven years ago, this started, brought three countries in, in, in the region to their knees and almost collapsed. It was the largest outbreak ever recorded, over 28,000 cases, more than 10,000 deaths, and there was a very slow response, both from the national authorities and also from WHO. The international health regulations, which were set up to uh, enable a good global response, really didn't help in that case. And the international response and research were slow to, to scale up. And it's estimated that the cost of the outbreak controlling it was $3.6 billion, which is about three times the annual budget of WHO to control everything. And uh, the socioeconomic costs were also huge and estimated to be another two billion on top of the control of the outbreak. So what was felt needed to be done after the Ebola outbreak? A need to strengthen national public health services, strengthen global health leadership, make sure we've got better coordination, the international health regulations needed strengthening and we needed to be better prepared, particularly for uh, 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 making sure we have trained responders, but also drugs, vaccines and equipment. 
And as you as you can, if you reflect on this for the coronavirus outbreak, some of those problems still very much loom. It would be great if we could forecast the future. Um, if we knew what outbreak was going to occur when and where. And we have lots of tools for doing it, um, but most of the time, this is like gazing into a crystal ball and it's hard to know what's going to happen. I can tell you that there is going to be another major uh, outbreak and uh, pandemic, but I can't tell you when or what or where that's going to be. Sometimes you can predict that these sort of things are going to happen. As I've mentioned previously, cholera in Yemen was something that was entirely predictable uh, based on what was uh, going on in context. So coronavirus, um, it's quite something to think that the first report of this was on New Year's Eve last year with a report of 27 pneumonia cases in, in Wuhan and just how quickly this developed. By the 13th of January, the first cases were being reported outside China. The week before that, the uh, virus had been isolated and the sequence itself was shared and a new diagnostic test was set up very rapidly indeed. This was zoonosis. It's related to SARS and to MERS being a coronavirus. So we could say it's not unexpected that this emerged, but we were pretty unprepared. The issues here were it's respiratory spread, it's infectious before it's symptomatic, and we have a large proportion of asymptomatic cases. So transmission occurs and are not easily recognised. The infection fatality rate is pretty low, but this is also age dependent. We have a lot of different ways of developing epidemic intelligence so that we know when clusters are occurring uh, around the world. ProMed, GoOn, HealthMap are all examples where this occurs. But the response has to start locally. And this is the rate limiting fact in preventing the spread of outbreak of diseases. It's the response at the front line in the communities and the countries at risk that really matters and is crucial that we um, improve. And here are sorts of people that I'm talking about when we're talking about um, the front line. Um, people who might be health workers in peripheral health units or community workers or simply elders within that community. And it's really important that there's trust and engagement and investment occurring between these people here at the periphery and the central uh, uh, health ministries and, and the, uh, the experts who are there. If they don't pay any attention or they dismiss the reports are coming from people in these villages, then we're all vulnerable to infections occurring. It's also important that we understand local context. And so the sort of social science anthropological element is also important if you're trying to respond to uh, an, an outbreak. And these are just some of the things that we need to understand if you're trying to control um, an outbreak. And we've seen this in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo with the Ebola outbreak in the east of the country. DRC was on high alert for an, uh, an Ebola outbreak. It always is because this is where nearly all of them occur. But there were months of delay from um, actually uh, an outbreak starting on this occasion to it actually reaching uh, the national authorities. And part of that was that there was a health workers strike going on at the time. Once the national authorities did know, then there was a quick response both national and international. And this occurred in an area with poor security, a humanitarian crisis going on, a lot of community suspicious and uh, very difficult logistics within the area. So this was a real challenge to control. 
if we look globally, um, here is um, a preparedness index that's put together by country by WHO. And this looks at how well prepared countries are for outbreaks to occur. Um, level five, which is the best, um, there are no countries which are fully prepared, which may not surprise you. Um, level four, the UK, USA, most of Western Europe would fit into uh, that category. Um, level three in yellow um, shows you many of the other countries, but the ones to worry about are level one and level two, which uh, affect most of sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, the South Asian uh, region, and also some areas of South and Central America. And these are the areas which have the weakest preparedness. And frankly, if uh, health systems are weak and unprepared, we're all vulnerable. We're all dependent on those weakest links in the, in the chain because the outbreak can spread to other countries. There are, in addition, international rapid response teams and local reservists. You've heard from Stephen about one uh, example here. Um, Africa CDC have got now an epidemic response team for the continent. Um, there are external rapid response teams, things like US CDC, China CDC, Robert Koch, Institute Pasteur, all have um, rapid response teams ready to respond internationally and uh, the UK too with the Public Health Rapid Response Team. And there's also been strengthening of WHO's Global Outbreak Alert Response Network, which coordinates uh, the international response. But importantly, national res rapid response teams are taking off in vulnerable countries. So places like Nigeria, Sudan, South Africa, Indonesia now have national rapid response teams of their own and clearly this is the way that this needs to go. Dealing with an outbreak response is a complicated business. Here is just um, a, a typical example. This comes from WHO looking at the different pillars here. So things like case management and funerals, epidemiology, laboratory, logistics, security, social mobilization, health education, all need to be coordinated in a multifaceted response. But we mustn't forget res uh, research. Research was not part of that diagram that I just showed you, but it's increasingly recognized that it needs to be an integral part. Uh, a lot of interventions for outbreaks can only be fully evaluated when there are actually cases. WHO now has a research and development blueprint for action to for uh, preventing uh, outbreaks. Um, and there is a change in, in mindsets and research is becoming much more uh, a part of the response. So one example would be the Ebola vaccine, which was uh, developed during um, a, an outbreak of uh, DR, uh, uh, Ebola in West Africa, and that's being currently used in all subsequent outbreaks that occur. Um, uh, randomized controlled trials of therapeutics, um, for example, for Ebola, but also uh, the development of what's called MURI, which is monitored emergency use of unregistered interventions. Um, this, this, uh, this is, this is used for experimental therapeutics where they're not within a formal trial and using real-time sequencing to understand transmission is occurring much more. And we've seen some of this with the coronavirus outbreak with uh, uh, reports about uh, vaccine efficacy for, for vaccines coming out very quickly, demonstrating the benefits of uh, dexamethasone. And also there's now... Um, uh, approval for use of some monoclonals. So what's the future? What do we need to do? Well, we need better methods to be able to anticipate disease threats and, and hotspots, uh, a solid flow of information on suspect cases, preparation and training of 
of, uh, of the workforce between outbreaks, funding in place so that we do have fast and effective responses that are occurring. That frontline human capacity and developing public health systems are absolutely crucial and I'd say are the main weak link that we have. International capacity that can support and boost that front line, they shouldn't take the lead. National responses should be the better. And of course, not forgetting research for the future so that we have better tools and interventions. Okay, so uh, that's my last slide. I'll stop sharing now. And um, uh, it, if we have time for questions, then I'll be happy to, to stay online to, to chat. Thanks so much, Jimmy. A fantastic, really interesting talk that. Um, a few things to think about, isn't there, for this pandemic and, and the next. So, I've got, yeah, got quite a few questions, but pick, pick two or three. So, certainly, you, your presentation there seemed to allude that um, pandemics are, whilst we can't predict when they're going to happen, they should be expected. So, do, do you think we should have expected? A, a, we should have expected another coronavirus pandemic, um, or the company when. And if so, think about the COVID-19 pandemic in particular, how we, um, perhaps the UK in particular, could have been better prepared for it to perhaps prevent some of the, imp uh, the impact it's had. Okay, I'm not getting you very clearly, Ben, but what I think you're saying there is about, you know, anticipating um, outbreaks that, that are, uh, are occurring. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> there's several thousand coronaviruses that have been documented to infect bats of different sorts and there's probably the same number again if not more that have never been characterized within within bats so there is a huge um uh iceberg, if you like, of, of potential viruses which can come into the human population. Now, in that WHO R&D blueprint that I told you about, one of the priorities is uh, it's characterized as MERS, SARS and other coronaviruses. So there was a recognition and it was one of the uh, top priorities uh, for, for working on um, um, beforehand. And I think that gave us um, a bit of a, uh, a leg up when um, the outbreak occurred and we were looking for therapeutics, diagnostics and, um, and vaccines in that some work had been done on coronaviruses before. And so we did have some knowledge about what was, what was going on. Um, but um, you know, I mean, the ideal thing would be to have some uh, pan-coronavirus vaccine that protects us from all coronaviruses. But I think, to be honest, that's a long way in the future. Uh, and do, do you think governments, but you know, particularly like the UK government, knowing that a pandemic, a coronavirus pandemic, was at some point inevitable? Could the UK government have done anything different in those early stages, January, February, in terms of preparing for when it came to the UK? Well, I think some of the elements that I was talking about there, things like being prepared and making sure you, you have the equipment, you have the trained personnel before the outbreak occurs, is something that had slipped in, in the UK. Um, and I, I think it was it was clear that that was the case. Um, I was involved peripherally in a, a simulation exercise that was done on a pandemic flu outbreak occurring, um, I think a couple of years before uh, coronavirus came. And I saw the report of, of what needed to be done and showing where the limitations were. Um, and... Uh, I, I hadn't realised until this outbreak occurred that nothing was done about that. Nothing was done to actually uh, follow up on the findings from that simulation exercise, which um, I think is, is pretty shocking considering we're supposed to be a level four country in terms of our, our prevention for this. The other thing is that um, the plans that we had for dealing with these were focused on uh, pandemic influenza. 
And um, while I think that's reasonable in that um, we didn't know very much about coronavirus when it, it first occurred and what the epidemiology and what its characteristics were, um, we perhaps could have moved a bit faster and had a more open mind about thinking, oh, well, this is actually quite different and uh, we we perhaps need to change our approaches. I think that occurred a bit late and we're a bit rigid in sticking to the pandemic flu uh, paradigm when that was clearly no longer the best approach. Uh, so there's one final qu or commenting question from Stephen. So Stephen feels that the outlook um, for future out outbreaks sounds pretty bleak, given that another pandemic will occur. We may not be fully prepared for it. Is there any light on the horizon for when and if the next pandemic occurs? Well, one hopes that um, perhaps some of the pious words that we hear um, every time there is an outbreak, that never again we must be better prepared next time, will actually follow through this time. We, we hear this every time, oh, we must be better prepared, we mustn't let it occur like this again. And then if you've been dealing like I have with outbreaks year after year after year in place after place, it's it's really quite sad the way that we keep having to relearn the lesson each time that this occurs. And also a sort of side point here is that, I don't know, there's, there's quite a rigidity of thinking. So we always seem to be fighting the last war rather than the current war. So in Ebola, you would hear people talking about, oh, when we last had influenza, we did such and such. And you want to shake them and say, yeah, but this is Ebola, this isn't flu. But then when we had Zika, you get people saying, ah, oh, when we had Ebola, we did such and such. And you you start to tear your hair out. So we don't want to fight the last war. We want to be prepared to fight the new war and be prepared for what this is. And we need to be better prepared in the first place with the sort of generic things that are going to be useful, whatever. So having uh, PPE uh, available and in stock um, would be a, a start um, uh, for the for the future, it's it, it's it's money well invested. As I as I hinted there before, with the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, that dealing with that in three countries cost more than WHO's annual recurring budget. I mean that just brings home to you how how much uh, better it is to be prepared rather than to have to respond to outbreaks. All right. I'll just have one very quick question just regarding a, a particular example. So talking about uh, the test and trace either in the UK or in other countries. Do you think the uh, pandemic and controlling outbreaks would benefit from a, a centralised test and trace system or kind of this more localised system as, we, as we're moving towards? I think you need a bit of both. I think I think um, to have coordination and a centralised system uh, does make sense, rather than to have an ill-coordinated set of responses in a country. But I think that um, you do need that uh, local uh, element as well. You need people who are going to be able to knock on doors. Uh, not just to give up because they can't get through on the phone. You need people who understand how societies work and interact and can can pick up uh, with somebody saying, oh, yeah, well, it was when I went down to the Market Cross that I got it, because you've heard about a lot of other people who, who went down there, which you wouldn't get otherwise. So I think you do need both of those elements. I also think that, I mean, it's not just the UK, all of Western Europe has uh, really failed to, to control uh, a, a second wave from occurring um, with their test and trace. And I think part of this is that the numbers are simply too big to be able to do this uh, properly and to make much difference here. But also, 
we haven't gone about it with the same thoroughness that the successful programs in um, East Asia have, have, have done. So, for example, if you're in Taiwan, if you... Um, if you're uh, identified as a case and you're notified that you need to self-isolate, you will then be contacted twice a day during that period of your um, isolation. And that might be by people coming to visit you. It might be by text messages that are coming. And indeed, there are IT uh, 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 solutions as, as as well that are involved here. So there's a reinforcement of the message, but also support for helping you to actually control. So so you can respond with a text message when you're asked about how your health is, whether you've got any symptoms, whether you've got any issues or whatever. Um, they will provide you with groceries if you need them during that, that period of time. Um, so there is a point in engaging with, with the system. There are also pretty hefty fines if you don't um, uh comply with what they're doing but also and this might be for some of you it wouldn't work for me there's also um aspects where you can you can chat to um, um some sort of robot um to get some sort of uh uh support and some solace there i think to help you if you're you're particularly um uh, lonely some sort of um chat with siri or whatever it might be uh, but these seem to be much more successful when you have this follow-up support and reinforcement than simply ringing somebody up once and asking them to isolate, which I think we know from the follow-up that's been done, the majority of people don't actually fully comply. Yeah, I think, I think we'd all completely agree uh, with that. Uh, so I think that's the only question. I've got to hand back over to Stephen. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Ben, and thanks a lot, Ginny. Um, so just to round up, we've overran a little bit today, but that's because uh, it was just fascinating stuff. And um, I'm just really grateful to all of our speakers today for sharing their time, obviously, but also for their insights, their ideas, their experience, research, data, the lot of, the lot of it. Um, and really what I hope, uh, and this might be kind of preaching to the choir, I suppose, but that's you know, all of us leave today with the idea that global health really is a kind of misnomer uh, and there's just health. Uh, and uh, the modern world being the way it is, we can't really think in terms of tropical diseases and, and local diseases. We, we need to be aware of what's going on all around us and where we can, you know, uh, as befits our skills and time and interests, try to take a role and, and, and advocate or research or study or read or teach uh, and and kind of you know be a bit more perhaps proactive in this area. And with that in mind, um, uh, I'd just like to plug our little pings group again one more time. Uh, um, if there are any students who are on the call who are thinking about doing an MRes, do please get in touch. I know uh, the MRC in the Gambia is very happy to have students every year. Uh, uh, Karen Forrest, uh, who's in charge of clinical services, has been on the the, the meeting most of this morning, but she's had to leave now. Um, and I think that's it, really. That's all I've got left to say. Uh, uh, thanks for joining us and goodbye.